Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Good morning and welcome to worship here at Shepherd of the Lakes Lutheran Church, where it is our joy as always to share our shepherd with you, no matter who you may be. And so we welcome all of you in attendance with us. We welcome those who are streaming online with us. Please let us know that you're there in the comments. And we welcome any visitors who might be with us today. Um, if you are visiting with us, we humbly ask you to fill out the welcome cards that are in the chair in front of you um, with some information you're comfortable with sharing. We simply want to say thank you for being with us today. And you can place that welcome card in the offering plate as it passes by this morning. Uh, today we continue uh, in this season of Easter with this wonderful thought that He lives. And He doesn't just live, He lives for us. He lives to do things for us. And so today we note that our Savior lives to restore hope for us. As sinful human beings, oftentimes we can get in our own way. Uh, our own thoughts, our own wants, our own expectations can get in the way and, and make things seem like it's hopeless. But Christ comes again and again to us in His Word and reminds us again of that hope, reminds us of how wonderful that Word is. We'll talk about that in our service for today. Our service is laid out for you in your worship folder. We're going to be following along uh, with the, the new service setting that is coming with our new hymnals that are to come, the setting one. It'll be printed out for you in your folder. It's going to be available for you today on the screens as well. Uh, this morning, we are going to begin with our opening hymn, The Strife is O'er, The Battle Done, which you can find on the screens and in your insert. Um, please note, if you're looking at the insert, uh, just a quick instruction, that refrain will only sing the refrain before the first stanza and then after the last stanza. That's when we will sing those refrains. May the Lord bless your worship this morning.
Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment, both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent His only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave His life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation... Let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. We join to sing. Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, by the humiliation of your Son, you lifted up this fallen world from the despair of death. By his resurrection to life, grant your faithful people gladness of heart and the hope of eternal joys. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
we turn our attention to God's word selected for today, beginning with a reading from Acts chapter 2. These words will serve as our sermon text for today. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Later he says, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll continue now with our Psalm of the Day, Psalm 116b, which you can find in your insert and on the screens. We will sing it together. Our second reading is taken from 1 Peter chapter 1, a reminder to live in the hope that we certainly have. Since you call on a Father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. 
For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through Him you believe in God, who raised Him from the dead and glorified Him. And so your faith and hope are in God. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us acclaim the Gospel with our verse of the day and its spoken response. Alleluia! Were not our hearts burning within us while He talked with us on the road and opened the Scriptures to us? Alleluia! Praise God for a living hope. Christ is risen from the dead. Please stand for the Gospel. Our gospel for this morning is taken from Luke chapter two, uh, 24, uh, the account of the Emmaus disciples. Now, even though we're, we're doing this uh, a few Sundays after Easter, uh, keep timeline in mind that this happened on the day of Easter. Now, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he, they were going further, as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. The gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated. We'll continue with our hymn of the day, Christ the Lord is Risen Again, found on the screens and on uh, hymn number 155 in the red hymnals in the chairs in front of you.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Did you tense up at all yesterday or even today when you heard that phrase, then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd? Now you may ask, well, why would you tense up? Well, let's consider Peter's track record. Hasn't always been the best, has it? Hasn't always said good things. Certainly he said some good things, but he's also said some really bad things as well. But today, as he spoke on that day of Pentecost, he, he spoke something wonderful. He spoke uh, something very, very good. Because as he spoke, as he addressed that crowd, as he preached this sermon, he preached like any good preacher should. He preached the law. He preached specific law. He convicted the people of their sins. He showed them their sins. And he preached gospel. Specific gospel, declaring the risen Christ and everything that He had done for them. It would be through this preaching, it would be through this word that the people would be provided with assurance. These people would have this assurance of hope in the fact that Jesus is alive. And so to today find assurance as we go to these very words, these inspired words of Peter. We find, and as we find this assurance, we find that our hope once again is restored. And we need that hope restored because often we let ourselves get in the way of that hope. When times we, we find ourselves letting preconceived notions, we find ourselves letting wants and expectations get in the way of what we should be seeing and understanding. If left alone to that, if one leaves himself alone in that, one is going to find himself hopeless. Be assured, brothers and sisters, be assured, because your Lord and Messiah provides hope in the Word. Your Lord and Messiah provides hope to those even far away. Now, we began our, our study of the book of Acts last week, uh, setting the stage for, for the next few weeks that are to come. And we, we began last week with, or we ended last week with the phrase that we begin this week, God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of it. Now, Peter uh, continues his, his uh, Pentecost sermon to those uh, Jews gathered around him this way. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. Jesus was certainly alive. His work here on this earth completed, but that doesn't mean he was done working. No, he ascended to the right hand of God, and that's just not a location. It's not just a place where he is sitting inactively. No, he is sitting there at the right hand of God in ruling activity. He is up there reigning, and he begins his reign by, by pouring out that Holy Spirit that he promised on the, the apostles. And that was the very thing that the crowds were witnessing there. When the Holy Spirit came in wind and fire, this is what was taking place. Peter points out that this exaltation had been promised. This was the only end result of Christ's saving work here on this earth. He says, For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Jesus, or sorry, David did not ascend to heaven. He wasn't brought up and exalted to sit at the right hand of God. No, he was a looking ahead to his descendant. He was looking ahead to his Lord, to his Messiah. And that's exactly who Jesus is. And that's exactly who Jesus wants these people to know. What he wants these people to know. These people had thought Jesus a criminal. They had thought him a blasphemer. They had humiliated him in the lowest way possible by putting him to death on the cross. But on the opposite side, 
What God has done is exalt Jesus, declaring Him to be that Lord, declaring Him to be Lord and Messiah of all. Now, when these people came to Jesus, they came to Him with their their own wants, their own expectations, their own preconceived notions. They had accused Him of all of these things. They had denied Him in favor of King Caesar. But their initial biases and opinions, their expectations were shattered. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? The word worked. There wasn't any complaining. There wasn't any pushback. There was no denial of putting Jesus to death on the cross They were cut to the heart. Their conscience was struck. They were convicted of their sin by this law. They recognized their situation as hopeless. The way they thought, the way they were conducting themselves was a hopeless situation. And they know that they needed to change. They know that that, that something had to happen. Otherwise, they would remain hopeless for eternity. And so they, they throw up their hands and say, What shall we do? Peter tells them to repent. Not simply just be sorry. They were already sorry, but repentance carries this idea of of a complete turnaround, a complete 180, to stop going one way and to go another way. How could they do that? How would that be possible? Be baptized, he says. In the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What was going to bring about this radical change was the Word. It was the gospel. It was the hope that the gospel provided. The gospel that accompanied Peter's sermon, the gospel was that that very gospel that was also then attached to baptism. Through that very baptism, forgiveness would be received as a result of that baptism. In that baptism, they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, probably better understood the gift that is the Holy Spirit. Through baptism, that Holy Spirit goes to work, creating faith, working forgiveness and salvation in the heart of the person being baptized. Through that forgiveness, the Holy Spirit would now bring about this new life, a new life that was assured of the hope of the living Christ, a life assured of the Lord and Messiah, who has brought about this hope for them. That's how powerful the Word is. That's how powerful both law and gospel are. Powerful enough to to, to destroy wants and expectations. Powerful enough to destroy preconceived notions or biases. Because it brings out the truth. We saw how it did so with the the Emmaus disciples in our gospel reading. They had lost hope. You saw how downcast they were when Jesus asked what had happened. They had hoped that Jesus was going to be someone who was going to make their nation greater. They had hoped that Jesus was going to be someone who was going to make their life easier. They had let their wants and expectations get in the way of the truths of Scripture, get in the way of the very things that Jesus had told him while he was alive. When Jesus died, their hopes of what they thought about him were instead made hopeless. But Jesus comes to them, the risen Jesus uses his word to to break that, to break them of that. He showed them what Scripture clearly states, that all of this was to bring about salvation. All of this had to happen. His suffering, His death and resurrection, all of it done so that He could provide certain hope for those disciples and for all. Much like those Emmaus disciples, how blessed we are to have those words in front of us, to have the Word in front of us. And so there should be no problems that we, we would, there shouldn't be any reason at all to not be assured of those same promises offered at Pentecost through Peter's words. But do we let that assurance fade? Do you find that that hope slips away at times? Do you find yourself asking, boy, I had hoped Jesus would. I had hoped Jesus would 
do this kind of thing for me. I really would have liked for Jesus to have provided this for me. I kind of expected for Jesus to make things easier, to make my life better, to simply just give me a a better way to live in this world, to make the world around me a better place. Our sinful nature continues to trouble us. In our sin, we oftentimes let our our sinful wants and expectations and preconceptions take over. Instead of letting Christ come to us in His Word, we, we come to Him with wants and expectations, and they get in the way. They get in the way of the hope that we should have. And then, but as we do that, just like the Jews, we do something humiliating to Jesus. We, we make Him into something that He is not. We, we expect things of Him that He has never promised us. And when He doesn't live up to those wants and expectations, when He doesn't meet those things for us in our lives, we find ourselves being hopeless, wondering, we find ourselves doubtful in, in who our Savior Jesus really is. And how silly that must look to the rest of the world to have mopey, hopeless Christians walking around. We blind ourselves from Scripture and rob ourselves of assurance. But Christ comes to us in His Word. He comes to us through that very Word to to break us of that. He comes through His Word to to, to rock us, to point out our sinful wants and expectations, to, uh, to convict us, to cut us to the heart, to strike our conscience so that we can recognize really what's going on. He calls us to repent, to to turn around from the way that we are going because if we are left walking that way, we will end up being hopeless for eternity. But when He does that, when He speaks that law, when He convicts our hearts, your Lord and Messiah comes to provide you with something greater. He then comes to provide you with hope through that very same word. We heard about that hope in our second reading for today. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. This is who the Lord and Messiah is. This is the truth. This is reality. This is what He has done for you. Your Savior came to live a perfect life for you. Your Savior had to suffer and die. He needed to be crucified because He wanted to buy you. He wanted to purchase you by shedding His perfect blood. The, the God, our God Himself takes on human flesh, sheds His own blood. That blood of infinite value. And with that infinite value, He has made you yours. He has brought about your forgiveness and salvation. And what's more, this is the Lord and Messiah whose name you've been baptized into. This is the one who is your Lord and Messiah. Through that very baptism, you have been given that gift of the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit has worked that forgiveness and salvation your Savior has won for you. And so it is is His name that you can be assured. For this Jesus Christ, this Lord and Messiah, is one who has been exalted over all things. Sin, death itself, the devil and all of his forces, all of those who would dare to stand opposed to Him are nothing but a footstool for Him. He has conquered them. He has then given you victory, victory over sin, victory over the devil, victory over death itself, and has given you certain hope of a resurrection, a resurrection to be with Him in eternity. You have been given this certain hope of forgiveness and life, all of this assured right here, here in this Word. And so then it's this Word to which we cling Because it's through the proclamation of both law and gospel, our Lord and Messiah continues to restore that hope. 
And it's an important reminder for our spiritual lives when, when things start to seem hopeless. When we find ourselves getting in the way, we get to go back here and see this special blessing. But it's also incredibly important for our spiritual mission. The mission that God has given to His church. Because this hope isn't just for us. This message isn't just for, for us gathered here. We look back to the inspired words of Peter as he lets the crowd know that this assurance is certainly for them and for others. He says, The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. This hope wasn't just for the apostles. And it wasn't even just for the crowd of Jews who had gathered there. It's for all. Regardless of age, regardless of physical location in this world, God from eternity has chosen to call them to saving faith. He has chosen to call others as well. And Peter would go on to, to describe this. He would continue his sermon. Now Luke, the gospel writer and the writer of the book of Acts, sums it up, the rest of his sermon, with this one phrase. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Note that the, the translation's a little fuzzy. He actually says, be saved from this corrupt generation. They couldn't save themselves. Someone else had to do it. They needed to be saved from this corrupt generation because they, they couldn't get themselves out of it. Now, Jesus often uses that phrase too, the corrupt generation. And he's not talking about anything specific. He's not talking about you boomers. He's not talking about me, me millennials. He's not talking about any kind of specific age group. But he's talking about a spiritual generation, one that denies and rejects Jesus as Lord and Messiah. To be a part of that group means damnation. It means hopelessness. But here Jesus has now called them to saving faith. And what a result of that sermon how powerful that sermon, how powerful the word. Those who accepted his message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. In one explosive day, God grew the Christian church by 3,000 souls through the proclamation of law and gospel. Don't you wish you could see an explosion like that? Don't we sometimes wish we could grow our church in one day like that, our little church, into to 3,000? Don't I wish I had a sermon that resulted in that, too? How could something like that be? How does one get a 3,000 conversion day? Well, let's look back. Did it have anything to do with Peter? Was it because that he was such an orator that he was so skilled in what he said, so educated, that it, he had presented this, this logical, rational exposition that he had spent weeks and months on? No. Peter was a fisherman, most likely uneducated, and here he was kind of speaking off of the cuff. He didn't have any fancy presentation. He didn't have any note cards. He, he certainly didn't have any snacks or fancy coffee to offer or anything like that. He had the Word. And he preached it. And the Holy Spirit went to work. He had full assurance that his Lord and Messiah would provide hope to those gathered around him. And not just them but for those of all ages and locations throughout the world, as he and the eleven would go out and, and share that with the rest of the world. If we want a, a day like that, if we want a 3,000 conversion day, that's where our attention should be. That's where our focus should be. Now, are we saying that we, are, we should expect something like that to happen? No. But shouldn't we be assured that we possess something powerful enough to bring something like that about? Absolutely. Just like those Emmaus disciples, we know the power of the Word. After all, as we come together, as we sit here, do our hearts not burn as we hear again and again that wonderful message of hope, the message that Scripture has for us. Our Lord and Messiah has given us this assurance by providing us with hope. 
And we know that this hope isn't just for us. It's not for just we who are sitting here in these pews. It's for all whom our Lord and Messiah has called and will call. Right? There are those who remain a part of that corrupt generation still lost in unbelief. And so we, of course, need to reach them. We should be assured that what we have is going to bring that hope to those lost in hopelessness. And so we reach out to them. The law that we preach will strike the heart. It will lead people to see their sin, recognizing their hopelessness. And the gospel we declare will relieve that heart. It will provide hope. It will show them their risen Savior and everything He has done as their Lord and Messiah. And we can be assured of this because our Lord and Messiah does provide hope to those, even who are just born, to to those who are on death's door, to those who are here, to those in Jerusalem, to those at, at all corners of the globe. The more we proclaim that gospel, the more our Savior calls out to those lost, showing them the hope that they have in His resurrection. The more we baptize infants and adults alike, the more our Lord and Messiah pours out His Holy Spirit to work forgiveness and salvation and faith in hearts. What wonderful assurance that we have a Lord and Messiah who is exalted over all, who has, who, which everything is His footstool. Knowing that, we know He's going to continue to guide and to bless His church in its mission to proclaim the hope of the risen Lord, all the while sustaining and restoring the hope in His very people. Restoring the hope to you with His promises in the Word. With the reminder that you are baptized into His name with the, with, the wonderful, uh, with the wonderful blessing of His body and blood that really offers you the forgiveness of sins. What a wonderful hope that is. So we look at, at Peter's words and it's not something we, we need to cringe about, let alone make us lose any kind of hope. No, you can look at Peter's words and be assured. You can be assured because your Lord and Messiah is risen. And with that very message, with that very word, He provides hope. And with that hope restored, He gives you that very same message with the same assurance that He will use that message to provide hope for those who may even be far off. We find great assurance in these words. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us uh, confess the hope that we have by using the words of the Nicene Creed printed for you on page 5 and on the screens. We believe in one God, the Father and the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all
time we join together to pray, you can find those uh, responses available for you on the screens. Um, also today, uh, we include in our prayers a prayer on the behalf of, of the family of, of Dave Krieger, whose sister Ann Parcher passed away this week. And we also uh, once again pray on behalf of the sister uh, of our sister in Christ, Mary Salem. Uh, we've prayed for her before because she had developed cancer. Now, again, the cancer continues to spread, uh, and it's looking that time of life is coming close to an end. So we, we uh, pray for comfort in that regard. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for all your mercies, especially for the gift of your Son, through whom you have revealed your gracious will. We praise you for the Holy Spirit and his working through the means of grace. Plant your word in our hearts and cause it to produce fruit in our lives. Strengthen and defend your church, that by your word and sacraments, faith may grow and love toward all may increase. Support all who spread the light of your truth throughout the world. Keep our children in the grace of their baptisms. Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. Raise up Christians to serve you in the ministry of the word and in all godly walks of life. Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Give them wisdom that they may promote justice and hinder evil. Let your blessing rest on planting and harvest, commerce and industry, medicine and science, the arts and culture. Protect all who travel and care for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. Be with all who devote themselves to any useful task. Comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. We especially pray for, for Mary's sister. You alone, Lord, have the power to provide healing to those who are sick. We entrust to your care all who are suffering from illness or disease. We ask you to be with her in her time of illness. And if it is your will, give her comfort and strength in these times so that she may serve you with renewed strength and eagerness. Remember those who suffer persecution for the faith have mercy on those for whom death draws near. Grant them your love and take them into your tender care. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you, who now rest from their labors, especially Anne Parcher. Heavenly Father, comfort the family of Anne, whom you have now called to eternal glory in heaven. We praise you for making her your child in baptism and sustaining her faith through the good news about Jesus, our Savior. We thank you for the blessings you brought to your church, this community, and her family through her life of Christian service. May the peace and promise of your Son's atoning sacrifice on the cross and His empty tomb bring assurance to the hearts of all who mourn. Help us always to live in joyful anticipation of the day when You will call us from our graves. Unite us, reunite us with Anne and all believers and fill us with comfort and bliss in Your presence forever. The Lord, also console those who are mourning or living with sadness. Keep us in the true faith and bring us at last to the joys of heaven. Grant us these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus, who died and rose again. Amen. You may be seated. We continue now by gathering our thank offerings to the Lord.
Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who by his willing sacrifice on the cross took away the sins of the world and by his glorious resurrection restored everlasting life. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. We give thanks to you, O God, through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be our Savior, our Redeemer, and the messenger of your grace. Through him you made all things. In him you are well pleased. He is the incarnate Word, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. To fulfill your promises, he stretched out his hands on the cross and released from eternal death all who believe in you. As we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, We thank you that you have gathered us together to receive your Son's body and blood. Send us your Spirit, unite us as one, and strengthen our faith so that we may praise you in your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we glorify and honor you, O God our Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Amen. We join together to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night who was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen. we invite the confirmed members of Shepherd of the Lakes forward to receive the body and blood of your Lord. Uh, After the first table, once the organist has returned to the organ bench, we will join together in singing some of the stanzas of our distribution hymn, At the Lamb's High Feast We Sing.
true body of our Lord and the Savior, Jesus Christ, given into death for your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and the Savior, Jesus Christ, given into death for your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given into death for your sins. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. We continue with our closing hymn. This is the threefold truth.
Once again, good morning to all of you, and again, thank you for being with us today. Just a couple of announcements. I've been neglecting to do this for the last couple of weeks. Um, if you did order a Easter lily, you are free to take those home now. Uh, you can take them home, you can plant them, you can keep them, continue to remind yourself of that wonderful Easter message. Um, just, uh, just note again, if, if you are able and willing to help out with our, our little choir group, we're, we're working on um, one of the new services that is coming with the, the new hymnals. Um, we got the thumbs up to uh, purchase those hymnals, and so we're going to um, work on getting those hymnals purchased and, and brought into our sanctuary. Um, and so we're going to start working on one of the, the newer services that's got some newer music to it so that the choir can, can lead the congregation as we go through those uh, newer pieces of music. So if you can come stick around for a few minutes afterward, that'd be very helpful. And then after that, we will be ho- having our voters meeting in here. Um, we ho- encourage all of you to stick around for that. Uh, and then another encouragement for a, a new Bible study. Um, you'll note there, there are some little um, information things in your, your mailbox. Um, between five, there are five books in the Bible. If you put all the words together, they number about 2,800 words. To put that into perspective, the Gospel of Mark, the shortest gospel, is about 13,800 so words. Um, you may look at those, and one, there, there are four of them that are so short they don't have chapters. They're, they're just one chapter, some 20 verses long. Why? Well, I have something so short in there. They can't be great expositions of doctrine like the book of Romans. They can't be a, a long history of the life of Jesus. So why have them? You look at them and you, you see while, while they are very short but sweet, uh, filled with very important things for our spiritual lives. We'll be looking at those, uh, the, some of those books in, in the coming weeks. You've uh, got some information about those that will be there. Um, if you are a little hesitant because, well, what if I miss a lesson? That's okay. We're just doing one book at a time. So if you miss one, guess what? You're not going to miss any that has no nothing to do with what's going to be taking place at the next lesson. So a uh, <coughs> nice simple thing, especially with books we may not necessarily be familiar with um, in Scripture. Um, I believe that is all of the announcements that, that I have. Um, I do believe that there is an announcement uh, from the trustees regarding our Arbor Day. Oh, we'll do the breakfast one first. Yes, um, uh, some of the men of the congregation are once again hoping to put on a pancake breakfast uh, for the church, and that was going to be uh, May 21st after the service. Uh, so it'll be after the service, May uh, 21st, that Sunday. Hope uh, for you to come and, and enjoy. It went really well the first time, so really looking forward to, to having that again. So thank you for the guys who are planning that and putting that on. And now I believe our trustees have an announcement. The trustees of Shepherd of the Lakes would like to recruit everyone's help for spring cleaning and maintenance work around our buildings and grounds. Please join us Saturday, May 20th at 10 a.m. We will be performing tasks like cleaning windows, vacuuming carpets, steam cleaning the floor, spreading dirt along the north side of the parking lot, picking up rocks in the grass, trimming bushes, and weeding the flower beds around church. We will have lunch for everyone that stops by to help. If there are any questions, talk to Steve Eddy or Scott Neighbor. Thank you in advance for your help. Uh, there will be more uh, information on that coming out. I think.